This is a Barco CID421 CRT monitor, a 21 inch, which I picked out of a trash. And uh, it's a pretty cool CRT monitor as far as we go. It's a ultra high end monitor, as you can tell by the uh, privacy screening option it's got fitted. And uh, it also comes with this uh, pretty unique monitor specific color calibrator. We've got some software and we've got an actual uh, colorimeter type device which you're supposed to strap onto the screen and uh, do some calibration uh, stuff with. It has this uh, S-Video connector which uh, uh, plugs into a connector which is right under there and uh, you're supposed to use that to, I'm assuming, update the calibration stored locally in the monitor. Since this thing is from about 2001, you would assume that the actual monitor is doing quite a bit of stuff since uh, computers at the time would probably have had a bit of a hard time actually coping with the live color calibration. I mean, this, this is, uh, you know, the kind of thing you'd hook to some a dual Pentium 3 system or something of the likes. But uh, before we can get to play around with it, uh, we need to take it apart and uh, do something about the uh, uh, wheel here, because uh, as you can see the menu is uh, uh, absolutely unusable if we try to adjust the brightness uh, no matter which way I turn the wheel uh, it's just going up and up and up slowly so the encoder for this uh, menu has uh, got some issues so we're gonna have to take a look at that uh, other than that uh, this is it's it's just a giant monitor. Even for a 21 inch CRT, this is just way bigger than they normally come. I'm having issues fitting it in the in the frame. Uh, on the back side, it's got a bit of a weird input setup because you've only got a basically compartmentalized VGA coming in. You've got the separate B and Cs connecting it up and. Um, that just goes into straight into a VGA adapter, so I'm not really sure what they were uh, thinking about all that. Perhaps it has some other input options which you can enable through the menu. It's also got a 3-port USB hub and uh, an RS-232 interface for uh, just doing configuration stuff. As you may or may not be able to tell, it's also fan-cooled and I did manage to check in the menu how long this has been running and it's got about 14,000 hours on it. And you can tell that from from the sound. So if I'm going to use this thing, I'm going to have to do something about that. And we definitely have to fix the menu issue. So let's just flip this on its face and try and get it apart. And since we have the individual RGB channels, we can of course mess around with the colours. And when you flip it on its face like that, you really get a sense for what a towering behemoth of this really is. It's taller than my entire equipment stack over there. And the way it comes apart seems to be very old timey because we've just got a few giant flatheads around the corners. Ugh. And it took some figuring out, but uh, it seems that in order to get the rear to part from the front, uh, there's actually this little snappy thing there, which you need to use a bit of screwdriver action to get it to separate. But once that's figured out, this should just lift off. Oh, well, that doesn't reveal much. Yep, it seems we've just to uh, strip the skin off of a Terminator. I don't think I've ever seen a CRT this uh, well shielded. I mean, wow. That's just entirely canned. And on the other side of that, we have another model sticker. So this thing could probably be sold as an installation unit for racks and stuff. And that is the noise maker with its accumulated 14,000 hours of dust. And I must say, it doesn't look too bad. And if we remove the monitor mount, we have pretty good access to the front panel card. So let's just clean that to rotor encoder up. And with the encoder opened up, it's really obvious uh, what the issue is. Uh, as is all too common with these rotor encoder type devices, uh, just a little bit of grease from the axle has uh, leaked down onto the contact pads. and. That's just causing a bad contact, so a bit of cleaning and a bit of new grease on the excellent this thing should be like new. And with that, we have a working menu. Sweet.
Moving forward, let's lift the skirt on the actual electronics. Now uh, that's a lot of stuff in a big CRT. So let's see what we get when we take off the uh, six millimeter thick aluminium backplate. Now that's a properly industrial looking board. So we've got no less than 578 series regulators. It's 7812, 7912, and three separate 7805s for a lot of different 5 volt rails. And we have these weird aluminium standoffs which provide heat sinking for these uh, pretty unusual looking integrated circuits. So we've got uh, one analog device, AD816AYS, and we've got this really weird uh, turquoise uh, Philips cr 6928 a. Now this looks like a puppy which you would not want to have break on you because I'm pretty certain you will not find these in many devices. And over here we've got a, a Baku branded Wave 2 chip. This is, I'd wager this is just some FPGA type thing. They've stuck their own logo on. And finally I think we just have a little transistor sitting there along with a million little chips of support circuitry to keep everything glued together. I'm not going to dig too much deeper into this because I just wanted to make sure that everything looks okay. So that just leaves us to have a look at the tube containment chamber. So for all you CRT junkies, uh, the tube itself seems to be a Hitachi, made in Japan, uh, M5-1-LL-B683-X51-ABH. Is that a miraculous tube? You tell me, I know nothing about it. CAUTION! X radiation warning. And if we look really closely, we can just about make out some of the uh, actual high voltage, high power stuff driving the tube down there. That looks pretty standard for a CRT, I must say. Nothing really popping out at me, although everything seems to be of very high build quality. We've got a quality capsule around and a pretty decent sized high voltage transformer. Seems like, yeah, it's a dual layer board as well, so it's not going to suffer from the typical CRT monitor the solder joint failures. Uh, big power device on the heatsink there. Big stuff. And a little heatsink down there as well. Wonder what that's for. That seems to be the uh, coil drivers, actually. And that's the end of the tube. Lots of little adjusty looking things and bits and bobs. This thing has probably been trimmed pretty closely by hand at some stage in its life. And in there we've actually got another power supply. I'm not certain what that's for. Perhaps that's for your logic supply. Yeah, looks like it. We've got a primary side cap, a big transformer. Another big transformer. Yeah, that's going to be the... Oh, that's a giant heating in there. Yeah, that's going to be the logic power supply pairing all this stuff up there. <laughs> despite its little local regulation going on. So now I think I'm just gonna swap out that fan and uh, give this a big blowout with some compressed air and put it back together and try and perhaps have a play around with the menu on it and see if we can get the calibrator working. There we go, I was replacing the rather overripe fan and uh, actual rubber Fan mains, these are very ripe indeed, starting to crack, and these are very, very hard. So these were definitely coupling through a lot more of the noise that this worn ball bearing fan was ever intended to make into the chassis. This monster seems to be extremely sensitive to magnetic fields. The colours were almost inverted prior to the degauss. And I just shove the CD in the drive and you really can tell the vintage of this thing from the software because you've got this horribly gaudy auto-ironic sample which, get this, honks at you. Anyway, let's see what it does. I think this stuff is made for Windows NT so it's a bit surprising if it runs properly but I don't think it's supposed to do much except just uh, talk to the display and just to, I don't know, do some maths for it maybe? Because it seems as if uh, 
the CRT itself is able to store a lot of profiling stuff in it. Let's launch a calibrated talk. Checking communication channels. Yeah, that's not going to work because the USB cord isn't in. Alright, plugged it in. That might give us a bit of a better chance. Probably want to restart this. And while I was waiting for that, I had a look at the calibrator tool. And uh, you, you would wonder how you're supposed to attach this to the monitor. Well, it's pretty simple. Okay, so I'm actually starting to think that there might be a hardware issue on the monitor as uh, with regards to the communication. Because I, as stubborn as I am, I've put a lot of effort into trying to get this to work. So yeah, I tried getting it running on that uh, iMac G5 there, which was a major pain since the software doesn't work in OS X, you need OS 9 support. And I did all the setup piece stuff, got OS 9 working, and it still wouldn't work in any way. Uh, it might be because, because of software issues on the iMac, since uh, we are not running native OS 9, but... Yeah, I couldn't get that to work. Uh, then I tried another XP machine, uh, that uh, little laptop there, and it would not work at all. And then I actually went to a friend and borrowed that machine down there, which is a native Windows 98 machine with a period correct hardware. It's running a BX440 chipset and uh, everything as standard and as common for the era as you could possibly get. And it still doesn't work. Then I tried, uh, I think, five different Java versions on that machine and it still doesn't work. And then I connected everything up, I started sniffing the data on the serial port, and it seems the software is trying to communicate with the monitor, it's sending an A character over a 9600 baud serial connection, and the monitor just is not responding. Even if I manually open up Potty and give it an A character, it doesn't tell you anything, it doesn't reply to anything. Even though the transmit line on the serial port on the monitor seems to be sitting stable at about uh, negative 8 volts. So I think the hardware is working, it's just um, not communicating properly with a processor or anything. <sighs> And USB just doesn't work. I, I've got no idea how you're supposed to get that to work because it will go into the menu thing where you can adjust for brightness and contrast. It, that will work on all the computers, even the iMac, uh, but it, it will not do anything beyond that. As far as it'll go is that it will actually cheekily highlight the broken calibrator software if you press the button on the, pa on the front panel of a monitor. We could just uh, plug the USB cord in and uh, these like that, if it's detected, yeah, it highlights the broken calibrator software for you and that's all that it'll do. And if you exit the software you get the uh, display properties where you can DGOS works perfectly, adjust contrast, adjust brightness. You can start the software, but it doesn't bloody well work. And the only thing I'd want to do with the software is see if it has the hardware focus control that uh, it has advertised to have. So the monitor seems to be ever so slightly out of focus. And I'd just like to see if I can get it just a tad better. <sighs> but that doesn't seem to work. Oh yeah, and if you launch the software more than once, uh, you have to reboot your computer because it just gets stuck at loading images, uh, depending on which Java version you're running. Enterprise quality. Oh yeah, and uh, the calibrated talk software leaks memory, so it makes everything break after a while. So I was spending a quite considerable amount of more time to actually get this monitor to run at to more than 60Hz on my Windows 7 computers, I've finally been able to set it up to do some kind of a calibration on it. And I just did this uh, dry run uh, uncalibrated uh, test on it. And uh, if I crank all the contrast and brightness settings, we certainly do get some quite impressive uh, results out of it with a contrast ratio of 2762 to 1 and a gamma of 2.26. And the uh, uh, DE2K to Locus uh, values uh, seem to be pretty okay from what I've been able to gather on the net, so I think if we do a proper calibration on this thing, it should be able to perform quite admirably indeed. Uh, it does seem to have a quite high color temperature compared to the setting it's set to of the 6500K, so uh, I should probably adjust uh, that on the monitor. Although if I actually calibrate it on these settings, uh, the settings on the monitor should actually become quite true to reality, so 
I think I'm just gonna leave it like this because this looks pretty good. I can turn down the brightness a bit because this is a bit brighter than I like to see. But beyond that, this looks pretty damn good. And if you're curious, here's the testing setup. It's just uh, I've had got a bl black T-shirt in front of a monitor, and I've also fitted the uh, original blanking plate to my Spider 4 on there. So. I actually need to have this shirt because there's just too much ambient light leaking in otherwise. Alright, and after a grueling couple of hours of a so-called fast calibration using DispCal, we finally have some data to go on for this monitor. So it's a bit of a shame that uh, I can't get the software working and getting it properly focused up, if that would even work. Uh, but uh, the results, I think, speak for themselves as far as color accuracy is concerned. Now, I'm no expert, but uh, these data points, we've got a, a maximum uh, a delta E of 2.14 to the 6500K nominal color temperature. And uh, from what I've been able to gather around the internet, that's a very, very good value indeed. And the uh, normalized uh, values seem to be excellent as well. Below 1 seems to be about the lowest uh, uh, you can actually perceive with your eyes. And everything looks uh, all green and nice according to the software. But everything just looks really nice and linear. All the dots are following closely together and they're nice happy green colors. Uh, although the gamut uh, test thing doesn't seem to be rendering properly in my web browser. I think there's supposed to be a gamut shaped thing in the background here but it's just not drawing it. Uh, I did for reference reasons uh, do a verification measurement like this on my 24 inch Fujitsu Siemens uh, TN monitor which is a pretty generic uh, uh, 2008 ish uh, multi-tube backlit uh, TN monitor, which is not a very accurate monitor by, by any means, but uh, I did calibrate it recently, and uh, it comes out like this. <laughs> it's uh, nowhere near the level of accuracy we've got out of the CRT, and uh, yeah, everything's just uh, red and horrible on this one. So I'm just going to go by the green numbers and uh, put this CRT to use, I think. The nice thing we've also got is the 1500 to 1 uh, contrast ratio with a very dark black point that 0.04 candle per square meter. Especially since I run all my monitors at relatively low brightness, I set the CRT to the 60 candle per square meter brightness setting, and that actually seems to be in Cal still because we are very close to 60 candle per square meter. And when I've done the little uh, pre-calibration things, uh, I have noticed that uh, that adjustment tracks very well as long as everything is in the calibrated positions. So there you go, that's a quick look at the Barco reference calibrator 5 from about 2001 and it's a shame we couldn't really get everything working on it but for the time being I think I'm just gonna leave you with that and perhaps put some more time into it off camera. So thank you for watching, cheerio!